we set e many values. So say uh, we set uh, aside the last values. So now we have p1 up to bn up to bn plus e. And our suspects are b n plus e plus 1 up to b n plus 2 e. Now the trick is the following. <coughs> Out of these values <coughs> that you chose, only e of them can be wrong. Which means that these n values will have to be the correct values of your polynomial. But there are n many of them, so there is only one polynomial that will have these values. And then you simply check if the rest fits that polynomial. You see, the trick here was even if, say, e many values here that you are building polynomial from, if e many values are wrong, the only <coughs> way that these polynomials will fit these values, if it's only p, because since you have n plus e values and e of them can be wrong, it means when I put my polynomial to, if these guys do lie on the same polynomial, because n values will be correct, the only polynomial that can fit them is p. Right? Because n values uniquely determine of polynomial of degree n minus 1. Right? And notice, uh, once you find the fit, you will have a redundant information because you will have n values of your polynomial plus e many also correct values. Uh, and this is the key ingredient of perlekamp welch algorithm for fast decoding. Uh, the fact that you actually do have a redundant uh, information, once you isolate the errors, you, your polynomial is represented in a redundant way. So you see, once again, you sent uh, n plus 2 e many, so your polynomial p of x is again equal to a1 x, sorry, a1 plus a2 x plus a n x to the n minus 1. Uh, instantiate uh, uh, p of 1 all the way to p of n plus 2 e. So send uh, to your transmission channel n plus e values of this polynomial. Now I claim uh, if at most e values are wrong, I can still recover the coefficients of the polynomial. Why? If I isolate, so I would have to search, <coughs> notice this is extremely inefficient algorithm. I would have to search through all subsets, so I have altogether n plus 2e values, and I have to choose any subset of size e, so that will be a gigantic number of cases to check. So this is not a feasible algorithm, but we will make it feasible. So the claim is uh, you can uniquely recover. How? If you isolate correctly the errors, the rest, when you construct a polynomial from n many values, the rest of the values will have to fit. Because they are all correct values, you isolated the wrong values. Opposite, if you did not isolate, if you did not isolate all incorrect values, but some of the incorrect values sneaked in here, when it cannot happen that all of these points will belong to the same polynomial of degree n minus 1. Why? Because out of n plus e, 
values. At most, E's are, are incorrect. So at least n values will be correct. But if a polynomial of degree n minus 1 matches another polynomial at n values, these two polynomials must be identical. So the only way, after you iso isolate e many values, that the remainder can fit a single polynomial of degree n minus 1 if all the wrong values were isolated and all of these values are correct. Because if there were wrong values, still the number of correct values will be at least n. And this polynomial, right, must be exactly the polynomial p, right? But of course, the <coughs> wrong values will not fit, right? So if there is a polynomial that fits all of these, only polynomial that fits all of these values, is only polynomial p. Because given the number of errors, uh, sufficient number of values, namely n values, are correct. Thus, they have to uh, determine polynomial p. OK. In practice, uh, the numbers are standard is uh, because this is just uh, uh, 8 bytes, right? So what uh, you are going to uh, send is uh, you will going to send 200 bits out of, by sending 256 bits, uh, well, uh, 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 we will explain this, out of which you can afford 28 to be wrong and still uniquely determine it. Uh. So how do we solve two problems? First problem is uh, it's not possible to do it with integers because the values explode. So you cannot send them efficiently. And secondly, this is a humongous search. You cannot find, uh, you, you simply, you see this has to run in real time as your mobile phone operates the error correction machinery has to decode in real time, so at an amazing speed. So how do we solve that? The usual trick is somewhat similar to the reason how we control the sizes of polynomials when we do FFT by evaluating at complex roots of unity. Here, we evaluate them at something that is called Galois field. So what is a Galois field? So you see, this is a spectacular use of something that is absolutely pure and probably one of the most spectacular branches of mathematics, namely Galois theory. You know, Galois was 18 when he got killed by being foolish in a duel. So he actually, night before, he got killed, and they, of course, he was a revolutionary. So the regime, French regime, placed a professional shooter and uh, killed Paul, Paul Guerrois. And the night before his death, he wrote the details of this. And he actually sent it to Cauchy, another great French mathematician. And Cauchy kept it in his drawer. Now, it's almost, uh, now I'm an old grumpy man, so uh, it's almost sure that Cauchy read it and understood it. Uh, but it also understood that it throws out of the water all of his results. Uh, so he chose not to, so it took quite a while before Galois theory got accepted. And it's one of the most beautiful fields of mathematics connecting group theory with field theory and with things like solving equations in terms of plus minus times uh, and divide and taking roots. The degree five polynomial uh, cannot have always solution in this, but also things like resecting the angle and then doubling the square and uh, uh, using just compass and uh, ruler 
and similar things. So what is Galois field? It turns out, uh, so what are the fields? Fields are essentially uh, things that allow you to solve equations, right? Uh, in fields, you have to be able to have multiplicative inverse for all non-zero elements, uh, right? So think of real numbers or, or complex numbers, or what's the most famous finite field? Uh, ZP, of the set of all remainders modulo prime, uh, right? Uh, this set, so it's just 0 to t minus 1 uh, with modular arithmetic, uh, it forms a field because for all x not equal to 0, there exists y uh, smaller than p, so that x times y is equal to 1 mod p. OK. Now, the question is, for what sizes do we have finite fields? It turns out that you can have a finite field, so something that satisfies all the nice axioms of field theory, uh, just in case the number of element is equal p to any integer k. So if uh, the number of elements is p to any integer k, then there exists a field with this many elements. <coughs> How is this field built? OK, for electrical engineers, you don't even have to know this, because uh, if you take p is equal to 2, and k is equal to 8, you get a Galois field denoted by gf of size 256, right? I think it's uh, this, or was it k that is in the definition? Uh, I think it's k, yeah? So gf8, uh, there exists a field of precisely 2 to the 8 equals 256 elements. And of course, this is a nice number for computer science, right, being a power of 2. And it turns out, moreover, that any field, any two fields with p to the k many elements for same p and k must be isomorphic. So there is actually only one field for every p prime and every k integer, there is only one field with this many elements. Uh, how is this field produced? Uh, well, uh, you simply you show that for every uh, field of, I mean, that for every number uh, p to the k, um, uh, there is exactly one polynomial well, that there exists a polynomial that cannot be factored in the field of uh, um, size p to the k, and then the elements of the field can be identified as polynomial uh, remainders of polynomial of any degree divided by this what's called irreducible polynomial. So p is irreducible if it's not equal to q of x times r of x, when neither q nor r are of degree 0. Right? So if p cannot be split into, uh, factored into two polynomials, it's called irreducible. And then the remainder of, uh, uh, of uh, any polynomial, say, s of x, when you divide it by p, p of x, you take the remainder and the set of these remainders can be seen to be isomorphic uh, to the initial field in the, um, when you, uh, uh, in this, that is isomorphic to this quotient field. In practice, you simply have table, right, that has uh, 256 uh, elements, and in this table, and you have elements that are simply called uh, A0, 
up to a uh, uh, two to the eight minus one, and you populate here. You simply store this as a table of plus, uh, and uh, similarly a table <coughs> of um, multiplication. So you don't have to actually even know what the elements of the field are. You can just uh, uh, store the operations uh, in this uh, in this field. Uh, the table of uh, uh, the two binary operations. Okay, so now uh, for uh, the, this is what is done in practice, uh, but for our purpose here we will restrict ourselves just to ZP because then elements are simply numbers between 0 and P minus 1 and we have, don't have to worry about Galois theory at all. So now, um, if you do that, then uh, um, the operations become just modular addition and modular uh, product. Okay. So um, we now have to show that in this field, if you form polynomials with these coefficients, okay, then all of these calcul then this calculation, this search becomes superfluous and can be replaced by um, a very fast, effective operation. Let me see if I forgot uh, anything. Okay, by the way, this type of encoding is called the Reed-Solomon uh, encoding. So you take my word for it that uh, uh, if we can just store these tables and then uh, use them when we compute in this field, let's now see uh, again, assume that uh, uh, we, so n will be say 256 for simplicity. Uh, we want to send, want to uh, send a message consisting of a sequence of arbitrary uh, 200 uh, symbols from uh, G uh, F8, right? Uh, so um, each or uh, let's let's simply do it for uh, say p many uh, symbols where p is prime. Uh, each an integer. Um, uh, say uh, uh, say L such that uh, L is between uh, 0 and uh, 256. Right? So each symbol is a byte. So it's pretty powerful uh, um, alphabet, right? You have uh, 256 symbols and you want to uh, send a sequence of 200 of them, right? So you can encode uh, lots of information. So now we need to show, so uh, we need to show that uh, um, so by what we explained, uh, we, what, uh, by what we explained, uh, um, um, 
so we will send instead uh, 256 values of the polynomial um, sum, say i is equal from 0 to 199, um, say, uh, uh, how did we denote it, say ai uh, x to the i for all i that go between 0 and uh, 255. Right? So you have your 200 uh, uh, symbols, which you can think of them um, as, uh, well, if we were really in, uh, in, uh, in Galois field, you can think of them as bytes, right? Because there are 256 of them. Uh, so here, AIs will be integers between 1 between 0 and p minus 1, right? Any sequence. Instead of sending them, we take this polynomial, and this we systematically evaluate them. I should put here not 255, but uh, uh, p minus 1. In practice, it's done with 255, but uh, uh, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, calculate with elements of uh, GF8, uh, uh, while uh, uh, when we work in ZP, everything is piece of cake. Uh, plus and times simply mean plus and times modulo P. Now, uh, so now we know that uh, if uh, out of uh, 256 received uh, symbols, 28, at most, 28 are wrong. We can still Uh, be called uh, the message uh, co totally correctly. So how do we do that? That's the tricky part, and the ingenious part on behalf of uh, Berlekam and Welch. So let me explain this to you. The idea is. Uh, to use the redundancy, right? I showed to you that if even 28 are wrong, uh, 256 minus 28, right? So 228 are correct, which is an overkill over 200 uh, values. And this overkill, this redundancy, is used to produce a polynomial that will block out the errors. errors. So this is the trick. So it's based on the following lemma. Uh, there exists uh, polynomials Q of X and uh, E of X such that uh, Q of X is of degree um, N minus 1 
a minus a, a, a minus e. Let me see, is this correct? Q is of degree, no, no, no. N minus one plus e. And e of x of degree e such that q of i is equal to pi times e of i for all um, i between 1 and p minus 1. Okay. So there is a polynomial of degree larger than n minus 1, but not too large, n minus 1 plus e. And another polynomial of degree e, so that this equation is true uh, for all e. Uh, proof. Uh, let e of i simply be the product of x minus um, i such that uh, 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 e of x such that i belongs to the set of errors. So you will take i if and only if b i was incorrectly received. How do we know which one it is? Well, we don't, but this only says there exist polynomials. So what is this polynomial? Polynomial e of x simply screens out the errors. In all points when e is wrongly received, so p of i was wrong, it was not it is not equal to the received value bi, right? So you, you take this polynomial. Now claim uh, the original uh, let q of x simply be equal p of x times e of x. And my claim is, so p is the original polynomial used to send the message. e of x is, so what is this polynomial? This is a very uh, simple polynomial. It is uh, just the original polynomial, but with a guy that will, be, that will set it equal to 0 at all erratic places. So it will change the value of polynomial p of x from p of i into 0 if, I is, uh, uh, if p of i is not b i. Now, why is this true? Well, it's totally trivial. Why? Assume that i is not an error. If i is not an error, then p of i will be, in fact, equal to b i. The correct, uh, the receive the symbol is correct, right? And whatever e i is, it's also on this side. So clearly, uh, q of i is equal to b i times uh, e of i, which is just what we need because p of i is in fact b i because b i was received correctly. Now assume now that i is an, er 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 an er erroneous place. i was wrongly received. Well, if i was wrongly uh, received, then this will be 0, thus q will be 0. But here also, because you have e, e of i will also be 0, 
right? So this product will be zero. So lo and behold, this equation for this particular polynomial, uh, this equation holds for all i's, right? Okay. So now, but we don't know what e is because we don't know what are the erratic places. Now this is where uh, this. Uh, uh, redundancy comes into the play because you now prove the following little lemma. Uh, if uh, um, q of x and e of x are any two polynomials of degrees n minus 1 plus e and e respectively such that um, uh, Q of I equals B I E of I for all I between 0 and P minus 1 then P of X must be equal to Q of X divided by E of X. So the trick is, E doesn't have to be at all the correct error screening polynomial, error blocking polynomial. And Q doesn't have at all um, to be produced as p of x times error screening polynomial. If you find absolutely any two polynomials that satisfy this equation for all i's, right, then p of x, then their quotient must be precisely your polynomial. Even if q of x and e of x are not obtained as error screening polynomial time p of x. If you find two polynomials with these properties, then you can obtain polynomial p of x simply by dividing q of x by e of x. Now, why is this so? Well, this is equivalent to saying that p of x times e of x must be equal to q of x. But why is this true? This true is for the follow this is true for the following reason. For whenever input x is a non-erratic input, right? Then this will be true because Q of i is in fact B of i uh, times E of i, right? If uh, the value received is correct, then obviously this will be, so if uh, x is equal some i such that uh, uh, P of i is in fact B of i, then P of X times, uh, then P of I times E of I is equal to B I times E of I, which is of course precisely Q of I in the force of uh, this. But how many values do we have that are correct? 
at most e many values are wrong. So at least n plus e many values are correct. So, but p of x, but uh, p of x is of degree n minus one. Multiplying it by e of x, e of x is of degree n. The product is of degree n minus one plus e. So you will have n plus e correct values of a polynomial of degree n minus one, right? And polynomial q of x is by assumption of degree n minus one plus e. So this is where the tendency comes in. Even though this was increased by e, it is still of sufficiently low degree that these two values will be equal at one point more than the, their corresponding degrees. So consequently, because they are equal, p of x can be produced simply by dividing q of x by e of x. Yeah, this is, you know, this is non-trivial stuff, but it's described in meticulous detail in my notes. So read it several times and do mental kind of process of going through every step. Uh, now, what is the benefit? The benefit is that all what we have to do is produce any two polynomials that satisfy this set of equations. How do we do that? We do it by brute force, <coughs> namely as follows. You know, this, is, this was a, an absolutely fundamental algorithm that allowed high-speed uh, telecommunications uh, because it made them error tolerant. Uh, so let's see how to get. You simply say, uh, <coughs> because uh, q of x uh, is uh, of degree n minus 1 plus e, I can write it in the form sum i is equal from 0 to n minus 1 uh, plus e. Say uh, lambda i times x to the i. And e of x can be written in the form sum i is equal from 0 to e say mu i x to the i, and then you instantiate this for all i between 1 and 255. What will you get? Right? You have to satisfy this uh, q of x is equal b i times e of x. Substitute this and that for all the values between 1 and 255, and you get system of linear equations in the norms lambda and i. Now, this will be j 